I'm Mary, and this is how I survived a stalker. I ended up getting married at 19, and I had three children by the time I was 21, and I ended up being divorced by the time I was 22. I was a single mom of three kids. My oldest son, he started playing football in middle school. That is where I met my stalker. The name I'm giving my stalker is Joe. He was my son's middle school football coach. At that point, it was still a coach-parent relationship. But in early 2007, I ran into him after a night out with my friends. We clicked and we started dating at that point. At the time, he had told me he was living in his wife's basement so he could be close to his daughter, but he considered them separated. We just started dating. And after a month or two, I found out that he was lying about staying in the basement at his wife's house and he was still married, not separated at all. And so I attempted to break off the relationship at that time. He was so persistent, just kept coming at me, didn't want to break up. At the time, I thought it was romantic that he wouldn't let me go. I feel like I missed that big red flag moment. He was very jealous and suspicious of me dating other people. And he would show up at my house to see if people were there. He just drove by constantly, called, texted constantly, and then he finally convinced me to get back together. All through this time, I began to realize that he was either a compulsive or a pathological liar. I'm not sure which one, but he was one of those. And he just lied about everything, even if it wasn't something of substance. So it wasn't long before I started seeing inappropriate messages with other women and eventually men. And I found out he was bisexual. Definitely was not okay with him messaging other women and men. And of course, I was confronting him as well when I see these messages coming through and he would lie about them or he would downplay them. It was a very tumultuous relationship from the get-go. Joe got divorced and by then he was living with me and my three children. It was just red flag after red flag, but I was just ignoring it because I thought that he was the person I was supposed to be with. It, it was devastating because when you're in a committed relationship, it's really difficult to look past any kind of deception or cheating. I remember there was one time that he was texting with someone and it was pretty explicit and there were pictures of and everything. I was mortified, like, why am I not enough for you? Yet he continued to do it. It, it was just so many downs in this relationship and not an awful lot of ups it took a lot for me to just end this relationship and i did it multiple times but he would always guilt me back although this was not a physically abusive relationship there was a lot of emotional turmoil that kind of made me feel like it was just the constant lying and cheating i just couldn't stand it anymore and if you can't trust the person you're with, then you really just should not be with them. So I did end up getting pregnant shortly after that and had my son. I was super excited about having my son, but all through my pregnancy, I was still having the stress of, he was still continuing to message other women, message other men. And it's just, it's soul crushing to be carrying this person's child and he has absolutely no respect for me and continues to do what he's doing. He constantly guilted me into remaining in the relationship. There was one time I was like, okay, I'm done. I'm done. And he was texting me and he said he was down at the river and it wasn't far from my house. And he said he had a gun in his mouth. And so I'm texting back and forth with him. And at this point, I'm, I'm not into the relationship anymore. I'm really close to enough is enough. And and as I was texting him, I saw the hallway light up towards the end of my hallway and see this light coming out of the bathroom every time I sent a text. I walked down the hallway and he's in the bathroom texting me, pretending that he's down at the river with the gun in his mouth. So he was super manipulative. So in June 2009, my son was about seven months old. I ended up ending the relationship completely. Everyone has to reach a point where enough was enough. It was just my enough. After that, I had to continue to see him because of our child in common. The end of it was just such a relief. 
I thought because I thought it was over and it really wasn't because he just kept with his manipulations and his lies and his begging and when his begging didn't work he would move on to being angry at me and he would use our son against me so some of the things that he did as far as stalking me he would drive by my house he would constantly call and text even though i had asked him to stop but his his behavior started to become a little more volatile and unbalanced. There was a time when my neighbor told me that it was at night he had seen Joe fall out of my tree and a big branch broke. And so he was hiding in the tree in my front yard and my neighbor saw it and heard a thud. And I kind of thought that was funny at the time, but it was just another one of those red flags. He was constantly accusing me of dating people and at this time I was just I was like I'm done with dating I don't want any more crazy people you know and he was just constantly badgering me and accusing me when it's like dude you were doing this when we were dating so you know when all of this was happening I had started making police reports and because I didn't have an order of protection, the police couldn't do anything about it. So I obtained a protective order. It had escalated so much that I was scared of him. And I bought pepper spray and a stun gun and I was sleeping with a knife under my pillow. I was terrified of him. He's a big guy and he was much bigger than I was. He was kind of in a mindset that if I can't have you, nobody will. He had begged me after a couple months to dismiss the protective order. He had said something about he couldn't get keep his job or get a job if the protective order was in place. And I was super naive at that time about the process of a protective order. His job would not have known about it, but he again, lied to me and I believed him. Um, so I dropped the protective order in December of 2009. He kept at it. He kept badgering me, following me, texting, calling, everything. And then in February of 2010, he broke my bedroom window over my head and he had kicked in the doors of a truck and slashed tires. The truck was in my driveway and he actually ended up getting arrested. He was charged with two counts of criminal mischief. It's a misdemeanor and it's like a slap on the wrist. It's like getting a speeding ticket. So, you know, it wasn't a lot to keep him from continuing. He lost his job at the school he was teaching at and he lost his coaching job. And it went into the newspapers, you know, were just there were several articles about what had happened and him being arrested. I was being destroyed in the comments on these news websites and I couldn't stop myself from reading them. He had a lot of support as, you know, a football coach at this huge high school. And there was tons of victim shaming going on. He was the hero and I was the person who destroyed that life for him. And I entered a deep depression at that point. You know, I was just wanting to defend myself, but there was no way to do that. And so I went into this isolation. And at that point, I just had a small tribe of people that were just, they were amazing. And they were the people who I could hide at their house if I needed to, because I had to do that a few times where um, I was so scared that I spent the night somewhere else and not letting him, Joe know where I am. He kept driving by and I kept calling the police and the police by this time are frustrated with me, with me because I have called them so many times over and over. And I was keeping logs of everything because I was told this was the best advice I could get was keep a log and keep calling the police. And I didn't know, but if you don't ask the police to make a report, they won't. So you have to ask for reports to be made. There was a time that he followed me for 20 minutes and I finally pulled over to the side of the road and was like, I got out and was screaming at him. I was so mad. And he said, oh, I just wanted to give my son a kiss. And it's, so he used my son against me. And, you know, I had another protective order finally issued in March of 2010. I wrote a letter to the prosecutor's office begging them to charge him with a felony of intimidation based on his arrest that he was charged the two misdemeanors and his continued stalking. But they wrote me back and said, nope, 
we don't have enough proof. In April of that year, 2010, there was a no contact order issued for the criminal mischief case. And so a no contact order is different from a protective order because it goes just for the length of the case. So he can't contact me. However, since we still had a child and he still had visitation rights, I still had to see him. So we had to meet in a public place. He would use those times to just just keep coming at me, wanting to get back together. And I can't tell you how many times I'm just like, no, I don't want anything to do with you. When he had visits with my son, he would drop him off to anybody who would take him and come check up on me because he knew that was my free time that I didn't have my other children. They were with their dad and he had my son. So he just assumed that I was going out, you know, meeting other guys. And so that just escalated the situation even more. At that point, I don't even know that he wanted a relationship with me. I think he just wanted, I don't know, to control my life. And then finally it came to this point where I thought it was going to be over. And it was this huge deal. The end of June, 2010, I was laying in bed. And at this point I had insomnia. I was on because of all my anxiety brought on by him. And I was just taking sleeping pills. I had a security camera installed and it was just like right at outside my bedroom. I would lay awake just watching the screen. It was just all night long, you know? So one night I heard rocks moving outside my bedroom window. And, you know, at this point I'd heard from the police so much. It's a, he said, she said, you don't have proof. You know, he had only been caught that one time. You know, I was super frustrated, but also like, this is never going to end. But that night I heard rocks moving outside my bedroom window. By this time I had borrowed a gun from one of my friends and I slept with it. And so I ran up the stairs and um, threw open the patio door and I looked to my left and there he is. He was dressed head to toe in black, black sneakers, black pants, black shirt, black hat, you know, everything. He was just covered and I shot at him. It was just, it was tunnel vision at that point because I was just like, I just want him to be caught. I just want him to be caught. And it was just so frustrating that it hadn't happened. And like, here he is. And I have the ability to stop him. And, you know, I could have shot him right then, but I just wanted him to stop. And I didn't want to kill him, but I wanted him to stop. And I was desperate. When I shot at him, he stopped. And he had jumped the fence and I was just holding the gun on him saying, if you move, I'll kill you. (laughs) And I had my phone in the other hand and I had called the police right when I heard him outside the bedroom window. Police were on the way. I was holding the gun on him and, you know, I point the gun down at the ground and he would start coming at me. So I point it back at him. You know, I had shot, I think maybe four or five times and I shot on either side of him because I didn't want to actually hit him, but I wanted to scare him into staying there. He was there when the police arrived and I'm standing there with my gun saying, I have the gun, I have the gun, I'm putting it down. And they're like, we don't care about you. The cops are, we don't care about you. We are getting him, you know, I'm like, okay. I was in such fear for my life at that point, you know, and I wouldn't recommend doing what I did, but it was just out of pure desperation. And so that was the second time he was arrested. And I was so relieved that it's like, see, see what he's doing to me. See what he's doing to me. The cops ended up finding a crowbar and a knife and a camouflage flashlight in the backyard. So I know that he was coming to hurt me. And at that point, I thought it was over. You know, he's done. He's going to jail. You know, I was hanging out with this guy named John. I had grown up with his sister. And so I didn't really know him all that well, but we grew up at the same church. So John and I are sitting in the backyard and we see legs underneath a bush at a neighbor's house. And so we kept looking and kept looking. And after about a minute or two, Joe pops out of the bushes. Like, seriously, you're going to still come at me after I shot at you, dude. This is ridiculous. Of course, we called the cops. And by the time, you know, they arrived, He was gone. He wasn't done with me. And it was just the frustration comes back. You know, the newspaper articles have started up again because a woman shooting at a guy. So here I am getting trashed again. I could feel myself kind of being pulled back into that depression and wanting to defend myself. It was in June that the shooting happened. And then in August, he drove by a few times and 
you know, I could see him out the window. So John happened to be there. And so we called the police. He drove by again before the police arrived. So, you know, he had driven by like four times already. I made a report with the police and John was a firefighter. So he knows a lot of cops, he knows a lot of firefighters. So he happened to know the police officer that had come to make the report. And so he was happened to be outside just talking to him after the report was filed. Again, Joe drives by and we're like, oh my God, that's him, that's him, that's him. He's driving by again. You know, I, I thought it was great. If John hadn't known this police officer, he wouldn't have been there to see it police come back and they're telling me, okay, you know, he's going to jail. They found a laminated collage of photos of me in his car. So after he was arrested the third time, he was finally charged with stalking. And the judge actually wrote the word dangerous on the court document and he set up a $200,000 bond. So I'm like, yes, he's not getting out of jail because that's a lot of money. In March, we moved to a different town still close by but you know it's i didn't tell anybody where i lived i changed my phone number changed my address and basically went into hiding may of that year in 2011 we received notice that um the trial date was set for june 14th and finally um he decided to plead guilty and it was because there was such a preponderance of evidence i had all my logs i had all this paperwork my case set a precedent with stalking because they charged him with the maximum and that was supposed to be six years but of course with the plea deal it ended up being reduced down to i think three years he was in jail for a couple months and then he served the rest of the time in prison but it wasn't over in july of that year so a couple months later I received notice he was going to be released in September of 2012. I filed for another protective order upon his release because the no contact order that goes along with the stalking charge in October 2013, he requested that his probation be terminated. So he wanted it to end early. I didn't fight it. I'm just like, whatever. I want that part of my life to be over with. In November 2016, so this is... Yeah, you know, six years later, he requested that the felony be reduced to a misdemeanor that I fought because I realized that if he got the felony reduced to the misdemeanor, like a traffic ticket, he'd be able to get a gun. So I wrote a victim impact statement. I sent it into the judge and he denied reducing the felony to the misdemeanor. I think that was probably the last court document that I got from him. So this spans several years and I just felt like it was never going to end. I share my story because I feel like it could help someone else that may be in the same situation that is not recognizing the red flags that I didn't recognize. I think that my story can bring people just some hope that there is someone that would believe them that you know it's not just a he said she said i believe you if you're you say you're being stalked i believe you victims do not often lie about assaults or stalking or domestic violence i would hope my story would convince someone to tell their truth be super vigilant about keeping logs super vigilant about telling the police to make a report because they won't otherwise reach out to a hotline to get support because there are people out there that will talk you through it. They'll talk you through the resources that you need to be safe. Advice that I would have is to, one, keep a log of every single thing and get a protective order because without a protective order, there's nothing that the judicial system can do for you. And although it is a piece of paper and doesn't necessarily protect you from a stalker, it allows the judicial system to start the process of calling these stalkers out, basically, you know, and if you have a stalker, call the police every single time even if they get tired of you. Thank you for listening to my story. Um, I hope you benefited from it. If you are a victim, please reach out. 
to someone and know that someone believed you. And if you are a friend of someone being stalked, just make sure you're there to support them and believe them and help protect them. Mm -hmm.